do that and share. Yeah. And continue. Okay. Right. Now, uh, oh, good. Now I can see everyone. Last time I did this, I couldn't. I was talking to the computer. I couldn't see a okay. face. That's so if you want to see, well, you can't see everyone, can you? You can see just a list down the side. Um, uh, oh, can you see? Right, just a list on the side. Yeah. And uh, you kind of might find that that gets in the way, but um, it's it's uh, you know just see how it goes, really. I guess I can move it around a little yeah, you bit. Can move, you can move it around, yeah. There, how's that? That'll work. That's okay. Oh, okay. Um, All right, so let me, mute, let me mute everybody. As soon as I do that, you'll have to unmute yourself. So uh, if you unmute yourself now, and I'm going to stop my camera. Okay. Right, so you have to unmute yourself, Sam, again. Sam, uh, so if you need to hit hit the unmute button, uh, unmute. Oh no, I can do it for you. There we go. So you, uh, say oh, something. Thank you. No, that's all right. That's fine. I, I haven't been able to do that before. That's interesting. Um, all right. That's interesting I'll, indeed. I'll mute myself, and I think you're ready to go. I have, for some reason there's nothing, no choice at the bottom of my screen. I'm not sure why. Uh, let me see. Uh, a full screen. Can I get full screen here? I'm trying to. Um, Just press on F5. Presentation at the bottom. F5. Okay, I'll try F5. Uh, there we are. All right, we're there. And let's see, we have this problem. I haven't had that problem before. All right. And then, um, good. Now we can work it. Um, today I thought I'd um, talk about quantum knots, and um, the title of this talk is Quantum Knots Revisited, and um, uh, this is joint work with Lou Kaufman, and this talk is based on the following papers, uh, Quantum Knots and Mosaics in the Journal of Quantum Information Processing, uh, and uh, to related papers, quantum knots and lattices. And if there's enough time, I'll talk about quantum lattice knots. I'm not sure how much time we have. And um, another paper, uh, quantizing braids and other mathematical structures. And um, uh, a while back, I had the, uh, the pleasure of spending a year in, uh, at the Institute for Scientific Exchange in uh, Torino. And I, I met uh, Mario Rossetti and Tullio Reggi, and they influenced a, a lot of ways I was thinking about uh, uh, quantum vortices. They have an interesting paper. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, is also motivated by um, uh, one of Kataev, Alexei Kataev's papers. Uh, throughout this talk, what I'm going to when I say not, I'll mean either not or link. That saves. Uh, a lot of work rather than repeat the same thing for uh, for each one respectively. I'll just simply say not, and it'll mean a not or a link. As an intro, um, I'd like to begin by saying that quantum mechanics is a tool for exploring uh, not theory. And uh, most amusingly, not theory is a useful tool for uh, studying quantum mechanics. Objectives of this talk are to create a quantum system that simulates a knotted physical piece of rope. Uh, to define a quantum knot in such a way as to represent the state of the knotted rope, that is particular spatial con uh, configuration and the knot tied in the rope. Uh, to model the ways of moving the rope around without cutting the rope and without letting it pass through itself. And see, last time I was at uh, Ampai gave a talk on quantum entanglement. I thought quantum knots would be a good follow-up. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, rules of the game, we can't just create any definition willy-nilly. We need uh, to find a good definition that's physically meaningful. Uh, and it is physically Im implementable. It may not be implementable by today's technology, but there's, it can be implemented in physics if uh, technology advance, advances to a certain level. 
simple enough to work with and be usable. It could be so complicated you can't do anything with it. Okay. Aspirations, we'd like, we'd hope that the definitions will be useful in modeling and predicting the behavior of knotted vortices that actually occur in quantum physics. And here's an outline of the talk. We'll start with knot theory and reduce knot theory to a formal rewriting system. And once we uh, do that, we'll take this formal rewriting system and we'll see that it's actually a group representation. And then we're done because from the perspective of mathematics, uh, quantum mechanics is really group representation theory. Um, if I go too fast for these slides, please let me know. It's an easy thing to do. The first thing I'd like to, uh, to mention is just the placement problem, which is not theory. And uh, we have an ambient space, uh, in this case, three, three space, um, and a group of audio auto homeomorphisms, which preserve the orientation of space. And we're given the space S1, a circle, and we'd like to place it inside of three space. And we're interested in the different types of placements. And of course, the big question is, when are two placements the same or not? I uh, will say that two placements are the same if there's an element of this group, G, which uh, transforms one into the other. And the basic problem of knot theory is when are two pres uh, presentations the same or placements the same. There's another definition of uh, equivalence knot, which is, uh, is actually equivalent to that, and that is two knots are equivalent to one another if there exists a continuous family of auto homeomorphisms of the entire space, which deforms one knot into the other. That's actually the same thing. Uh, this is called an isotopy. And now I'd like to begin by saying that knot theorists like to work in the shadows. And so we look at the projection of knots. And uh, a knot diagram a projection of a knot is simply a planar four valent graph with labeled vertices uh, where over and under crossing are so so labeled. Uh, Rider Meister moves. There's a Rider Meister one move, uh, the Rider Meister two move, and there's the Rider Meister three move. And um, these are all local moves, which will be important when we uh, transformed everything into quantum mechanics. And of course, there's a, a move that is there, but rarely referred to, and that's a planar isotopic move. You're allowed to squiggle uh, the knot in any way you'd like. So these are uh, uh, the famous Reitermeister moves. And uh, now we're able to answer when do two knot diagrams represent the same or different knots? And here's the famous theorem of Kurt Reitermeister. Two knot diagrams represent the same knot type if and only if one can be transformed into the other by a finite sequence of Reitermeister moves. This is a, a, a most remarkable uh, theorem um, that on, basically only three moves suffice for uh, representing all moves of knots in three space. Uh, and I find it most amusing because this uh, theorem has produced gainful employment for knot theorists for almost 100 years. It must be a useful theorem. Okay, preamble to uh, mosaic knots. Um, and en route to defining quantum knots, we encounter the following obstacle. Uh, the knot diagrams and Reitermeister moves form a category, but in quantum mechanics, we actually need a group. And our way around this, this problem is the following. We uh, use what we call the principle of conditional action. Uh, Reitermeister move acts as an identity transformation if it, can, uh, if it cannot be applied. And basically a Reitermeister move applies twice as the identity. Uh, you can, it undoes itself. And immediately we have that knot diagrams and with Reitermeister moves form a group. And hence, uh, 
all our moves are, and all our moves are, Rademeister moves are involutions. Okay. Um, interestingly, we had a, a number of spinoffs to working on this. Um, we were surprised to find that tame knot theory is uh, a basically a formal rewriting system that is a context sensitive formal language defined by linear bounded automata. Knots turn out, and we reduce knots to meaningless strings of symbols and rhythmized moves to simply rewriting rules or grammatical rules. And another spinoff is the following. We've created an axiomatic system that completely captures and defines tame knot theory. We weren't looking for such a thing, but it, it happened. Now we can talk about mosaic knots. So I'd like to introduce you to a mosaic knot. And here is one assembling itself. That pesky tile doesn't want to behave itself. And here we have an example of a mosaic trefoil knot. So what are mosaic uh, knots? Well, first we start with tiles. And there are basically 11 tiles. And here they are, it's so displayed. And uh, up to rotation, there are actually five tiles. We could actually do the entire theory without the, uh, the two tiles. I guess you can see my cursor. Uh, without these two tiles, but it would be more complicated. So there are actually you only really need four tiles, which is useful if you're representing something in terms of qubits. Uh, definition of an N mosaic. An N mosaic is simply an N by N matrix of tiles. It's a very simple idea. Here's an example of a four mosaic representing nothing, but it's a four mosaic. I've just tiled it. Um, I also saw some beautiful mosaics uh, in um, Italy. There's some beautiful, uh, well, uh, tile connection points. A connection point on a tile is a midpoint of an edge, which is also the end point of a curve drawn on a tile. And here is an example. This has no, um, the blank tile has no connection, connection points. Uh, this tile has two connection points, and this tile has four connection points, four black dots. Uh, and we'll say that two tiles are contig contiguous or adjacent to one another if they lie immediately next to each other, either in the same row or column. So for example, these two tiles are contiguous, and of course, these two tiles are not. So I'm taking a very simple idea and I'm beating to death. Uh, it, a tile in a mosaic is said to be suitably connected if all its connection points touch the connection points of contiguous tiles. And for example, we have the following. This tile is suitably connected because each of its two connection points is connected to a connection point of a uh, contiguous tile. Whereas this is not because uh, there are some of its connection points which are not connected to connection points of contiguous tiles. Very simple idea. So now we can define a knot mosaic is a mosaic with all tiles suitably connected. For example, this is a unknot, it's a nothing uh, mosaic, and we have the um, four mosaic representing the trefoil knot. These tiles are remarkably uh, versatile. In fact, it took a long time to find the right set of tiles, surprisingly. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, here's the figure eight knot, represented as a five mosaic. Um, Here's the hop link, uh, represented as a four mosaic. And we have the barman rings. Um, I guess you see these, this used to see this on beer bottles as a six mosaic. So you can represent any knot whatsoever in terms of mosaics. Uh, we'll need a notation here, MN will, M super N will denote the set of N mosaics and K super N would, will denote the set of uh, not in mosaics. Now we're talking, we need to get into Reitermeister's theorem. So we do, uh, we need to discuss cut and paste moves. Uh, and a K sub mosaic of an N mosaic is just a K by K sub, uh, sub matrix of the mosaic. Here's a two K sub mosaic, here are a number of them. I've just shown you various ones. 
Uh, I haven't counted them. I think there are nine there, if I count properly. Uh, a case of a sub mosaic move uh, on an in mosaic is a, is a move that replaces each case sub mosaic by another one. And here's an example. Um, we'll take this knot, uh, mosaic knot, and let's apply a cut and paste rule to it at this location. And uh, this is a Reitermeister two move. And let's do it one more time. And uh, once again, we applied, that was another Reitermeister two move if I, if I, I believe. And uh, so you can continue to do, uh, to do this. You can actually transform this into the original trefoil mosaic I showed you earlier. The interesting thing if, is that if I run this sequence of uh, cut and paste operations very rapidly, it looks like a movie. All right, let's get out of this. Uh, two different ways of thinking of case of mosaics. We need a little paradigm shift. They're cut and paste operations on mosaics. And, uh, but they're also uh, permutations acting on a finite set of n mosaics. We have the finite set of n by n uh, mosaics and a cut and paste operation simply uh, replaces one such mosaic by another. It simply permutes them. And of course, if you apply it uh, twice, uh, then it un it's undoes itself. It's an involution. Um, so these permute, each such move is, uh, is simply a product of disjoint uh, transpositions. Now that I've done that, I can talk about the various moves on knots, planar isotopy moves, the moves rarely mentioned. Uh, we use the following symbols to denote one of two possible tiles. I'm using non-deterministic tiles at this point to um, uh, simplify the exposition. They're not needed, but uh, the dialogue to describe everything would be much more complicated without them. For example, this tile denotes one of two possible tiles. It's, it's a non-deterministic tile. Uh, there are 11 planar isotopy moves, and here they are. Um, in terms of cut and paste operations. Go very quickly through those. Whoops, excuse me, go back up. Now, um, so if this uh, condition is satisfied, we cut out this section and replace it by the right and vice versa. We can take the, the right part of the move and if it's, uh, uh, its conditions are, matter, uh, are satisfied, replace it by the left. Now, I'd like you to keep in mind that uh, uh, each of the above is actually represents four moves. Or we can simply rotate the moves, both sides, by 0, 90, and 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. And for example, this move actually represents the following four moves. I just simply rotated both sides um, by the various angles. Another thing to consider is that each of the planar isotopy uh, moves represents any one of um, the number of possible locations. So there's a move for each possible location or application of the move. So there are quite a few such moves. All right, planar isotopy moves on mosaics. Each planar isotopy move acts as a local transformation uh, on in mosaics when its conditions are met. This is the principle of conditional action. Turns out to be very helpful. And each PI move is a permutation on the set of in mosaics. I mentioned this before. In fact, each planar isotopy move uh, as a permutation is merely a product of disjoint transpositions. That's because of the principle of uh, conditional action. Okay, now we get into the Reitermeister moves. Things start to get a little more complicated. A Reitermeister one moves, we have two of them. Of course, times four times the number of locations. Um, and you'll notice I'm using non-deterministic tiles. And the Reitermeister two moves, there are four of them, times four times the number of possible locations. Okay, and for the, um, 
Uh, for the Riemannster three moves, which are, are more complicated, we need some more non-deterministic uh, tiles. And here they are. Just this um, makes ease of exposition. Um, for example, this tile represents either the left tile or the right, the blue uh, as a solid red or the green as a solid red. Also, these tiles can be synchronized if they are labeled. If two such non-deterministic tiles have the same label, they're synchronized. And here's an example. In this case, the, uh, the blue uh, is um, uh, brought into existence. I guess that's one way of saying it. In which case, the corresponding synchronized uh, tile brings the green in existence, always the opposite color. And they are so synchronized. Here's some other examples of the same. So, and uh, here are the uh, Reinemeister moves. I believe there are um, six of them. Here they are written in terms of the non-deterministic tiles. All right, now we have that. And uh, just like the planar isotopy moves, each Reinemeister move is a permutation um, on the set of N mosaics. In fact, they're all products of disjoint transpositions which is good to know. Finally, we end up with the mosaic analog of the group of autohomeomorphisms. We'll call this the ambient group because it acts on the entire ambient space. We define the ambient isotopy group as a subgroup of the group of all permutations on the set of N mosaic knots generated by all the planar isotopy and Reinemeister moves. So we now have uh, assemble all really all the pieces we need and we can define knot type in terms of the moves basically uh, in terms of Reitermeister's theorem. We'll need a mosaic injection which is a very simple idea. This is its definition mathematically but in terms of pictures it's, it's easily seen to simply uh, in the injection simply takes an n by n mosaic and tacks on a column of blank tiles and a row of blank tiles to form an n, by, n plus one by n plus one mosaic. And uh, now um, look, we can define n mosaic type. Two mosaics are the same knot type, written in knot type, excuse me, provided one can be transformed into the other by a finite sequence of ambient group elements. Um, uh, two n mosaics are said to be of the same knot type if there exists a non-negative integer k so that under suitable enlargement um, they are n plus k um, uh, of the same uh, of the same n plus k knot type and this is an important stabilization condition um, frequently you can you can find many examples of knots that uh, um, cannot be transformed into one another unless uh, you enlarge the knots, enlarge the space they're in. Okay, uh, quantum mechanics in a nutshell. I, 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 I guess I should give this if uh, this is, uh, a lot of people know this already, some may not. Um, so I put this in, if, uh, if everyone knows this, please tell me and I'll um, quickly move to something else. Uh, the, Basically, I'm just uh, very, give you a very simple uh, survey of quantum mechanics. The state of a quantum system, psi, ket psi, is a vector. For, um, this is called as a ket uh, in a Hilbert space H. And a quantum system in state psi zero at time t zero changes into one at time t one by a unitary transformation which transforms one state into the other. These all lie in the unitary group of the Hilbert space. Okay. Um, an observable in quantum mechanics is an Hermitian operator, actually, um, um, basically whose uh, uh, um, adjoint conjugate transpose is equal to itself. And an important ob observable in uh, Hamilton is the Hamiltonian, which in quantum mechanics represents, uh, is the analog of the total classical energy of a physical system.
and uh, of course, uh, the evolution, time evolution of a state psi in a quantum system is determined by Schrodinger's equation, which is given uh, as shown. In fact, and finally, or not finally, given two quantum systems, uh, uh, respectively, and states psi one and psi two, the state of the total system, the bipartite system, is simply uh, the state constructed by taking tensor products of the Hilbert spaces. And the hardest part of quantum mechanics uh, for many people is measurement. I can't go into it. There, uh, there's a lot to measurement and I have to ignore POVMs. In any case, this uh, slide tries to capture um, very concisely what measurement is in this theory. And uh, the top of this box is the macro world, the inputs at the top, outputs at the top, and the quantum world is the bottom. And we have as inputs to the um, box in the macro world an observable, which measures the, which represents the measuring device. And uh, this has a spectral decomposition into eigenvalues and the corresponding projections of the eigenspaces. And the other input unseen to us is the quantum system. We don't see the quantum system. We see only the results of uh, observations. And uh, when measurement is made, um, uh, what is measured by the measuring device, a little meter on the measuring device, is an eigenvalue of the um, observable, omega, the mission operator, which is always a real number, and it immediately jumps into to the corresponding, the state of the system unseen to us, jumps into the corresponding eigenspace. All this happens probabilistically. Uh, we, in quantum mechanics, we can't completely determine the, the outcome of a measurement. We can only uh, predict it probabilistically. Now, what goes on inside the physical uh, in physical reality, the philosopher, I call this philosopher turf, no one really knows. A great debate goes on even today. No one really fully understands the meaning uh, of what is happening here. Okay, and let's see, quantum mechanics is not well understood. Uh, if you go to any physics conference, I've always had fun there, and I, uh, if you meet a, a friendly group of physicists, I'm sure we have some here, uh, and you mention a word called measurement, you end up with a huge debate and a fight. So if you want to have some fun, try it sometimes. Okay, uh, quantum knots and quantum systems. Um, but HP, the 11 dimensional Hilbert space with orthonormal basis labeled by the following tiles. And uh, so uh, labeled by, also by symbols T0 to T10. We define the Hilbert space MN of N mosaics um, as simply the tensor product of uh, N squared fold tensor product of all of these. We're dealing with N by N matrices. And uh, this is the Hilbert space with induced orthonormal basis. It's all N squared fold tensor product of all um, of tiles taken from the above set. So for example, let's see here, we had, oh, excuse me, we identify each basis element uh, with a cat labeled by N mosaic by using row major order. So for example, here is an example of a basis element in the nine-fold tensor product of our Hilbert space of tiles. And this is identified with the three mosaic uh, labeled, uh, so labeled. Um, let H be the 11-dimensional uh, Hilbert space. Let's see, what is this? Oh, here are the tiles. Um, oh, I think I'll go through this quickly. This, this uh, slide says the same thing. And so um, let me go through that. So this is the row major order. Once you do that, um, essentially a Hilbert space of quantum knots is defined as uh, the subspace of MN, the Hilbert space of mosaics spanned by the orthonormal basis elements labeled by uh, not in mosaics. It's an orthonormal basis. Okay, an example of a quantum knot. Here it is. This is an example. We'll come back to look at this later. This is a superposition of two different knots. Um, 
uh, just realize it may be hard for people to see these two knots are the same. This crossing is an overcrossing, this is an undercrossing. So they're actually different knots. Okay. Uh, the ambient group. Uh, we identify the elements of the ambient group with linear transformations. They simply permute the orthonormal basis. Um, and, and as a result, they are, uh, and it, you get a representation of a permutation group of symmetric matrix. Um, hence the ambient group uh, becomes a discrete group of unitary transformations um, on the Hilbert space of uh, in mosaic knots of quantum knots, excuse me. If I'm going too fast, let me know. But a lot of this is, we're just repeating the same thing, uh, but in terms of quantum knots. An example of the ambient uh, action of the ambient group is the following. Let's consider the following quantum knot, which is the superposition of the two. And let's apply a Reinemeister two move to the following location. Now, you'll notice that the condition uh, for the move R2 is uh, met in the left ket, but not in the right ket, right? And applying the Reinemeister two move to that particular location uh, um, produces an effect on the left ket that does nothing to the right ket. This is the conditional action that's used. Uh, and then we'll, we put it all together. We have a quantum knot system. We have a Hilbert space and an ambient group of unitary transformations. Um, the states of our uh, quantum system are quantum knots and the group elements are quantum moves. In fact, we have uh, basically uh, a long sequence uh, as we enlarge the mosaics, as the end of the mosaics get larger and larger mosaics, we have a uh, nested sequence of quantum knot systems, which each is phys physically implementable um, but probably but, uh, but not by today's technology. Okay, and here we have this, and I'd like to mention choosing an integer n is analogous to choosing a length of rope. The longer the rope, the more knots that can be tied. And um, the generators of the ambient group are actually like knobs that one can turn to spatially manipulate the, the, the quantum knot. So you can actually move it so it doesn't pass it. In this way, it doesn't pass through itself, uh, nor does it break apart. Um, quantum knot type, well, I think I'll go through, through this quickly unless someone uh, would like me to move more slowly. It's the same definition, but in terms of quantum knots, we have uh, basically uh, the same um, in type and of the same knot type under suitable enlargement. This condition is necessary for knot theory because uh, you need an inductive uh, axiom in knot theory, uh, and that's your stabilization condition. Okay, uh, we saw this. Uh, these two knots are of the same uh, knot n type. And here, are, here is an example of two knots, trivial knots in, in one sense, that are not of the same knot type. And I guess I'll leave this as a dare. I dare anyone to transform the bottom knot using the uh, Reinemeister and planar isotopy moves into the top knot. Surprisingly, these are different, but for good reason. All right. Uh, you can, now that we have assembled everything, uh, all the basic components of quantum mechanics, uh, we can talk about Hamiltonians and uh, each generator uh, can be, uh, um, uh, we can associate a Hamiltonian with each generator. Uh, if we take a generator, where if you recall, it's a product of disjoint transpositions of uh, mosaic n knots. And here they are, disjoint transposition. Uh, what we'll do is just re-index the knots, not change the knots in the transposition, just relabel them with a permutation gamma and put this in normalized form. And now we can see that the matrix corresponding to this is a very simple matrix where the sigma ones are the uh, first Holly spin operator. Each sigma one is performs a trans, uh, transposition. The first sigma one performs 
the transposition between K1 and K2. And now we, uh, if we have, let sigma zero be the identity transformation. And let's take the log of, well, the log of sigma one is a multi-valued uh, uh, function. And uh, for each integer K, we have a log, which is the principal branch of this. And now we can apply this uh, log operation to our, our matrix. We'll compute the, um, the um, natural log of the generator of that particular element of the group. And we end up with the following uh, a Hermitian matrix, which can, whoops, represents the Hamiltonian. And it turns out to be very simple. It's amazingly uh, simple. Okay. Now, Hamiltonians, using the Hamiltonians for the right of, Hamiltonian for the Reitermeister 2 move, as an example, here we have a Reitermeister 2 move, and uh, we'd like uh, an initial state we'd like to apply it to. Um, and uh, if we solve Schrodinger's equation, essentially we can transform, apply the move uh, over time from time uh, t equals 0, t equals 1, transforming this. Uh, into the knot after the move, okay, as we did before. Observables in quantum mechanics are interesting in themselves. There's a lot here. What do you mean by physically observable knot invariant? Uh, let uh, KN, AN be a knot system. And uh, let's consider a quantum observable. It has to be a Hermitian operator, but it needs to be a knot observable, a knot invariant. So which of these observables, omega, are actually not invariants? Uh, an observable, uh, omega is an invariant of quantum knots provided uh, its action uh, under the big adjoint operator of the, of the ambient group uh, uh, is as, as shown. Simply u, omega, u inverse, the big adjoint action has no effect. All right. And, but how do we find quantum knot observables? Well, we actually, in a certain sense, we can find all of them. Uh, we start with a quantum knot system. And uh, we let this be a, uh, the, the decomposition of, this is the group representation of this into irreducible representation spaces. And then for each L, the projection operator, piece of L for the subspace, is a quantum not observable. So we can get them all that way. An easier way of getting such observables, if I'm going too fast, let me know, is that we can let KN be a quantum knot system and omega be any observable whatsoever. Uh, we take the stabilizer group of omega, that is a set of all unitary transformations, which actually commute with omega, and then, uh, this, we can transform this into observable by taking this sum where we are now um, uh, summing over all a complete set of coset representatives of the stabilizer group. That's pretty technical, I guess, but uh, all right, I'll move on to other things. Uh, the following is another example of a quantum not invariant observable. You can, you can take any observable you'd like to create a quantum not invariant. Uh, as shown. And for instance, this uh, I of K could be the genus of a knot or the crossing number of knot. And thus uh, um, I of K represents the energy levels that can occur. Okay, uh, a different approach. Let's see how much, I don't think I have enough time. Uh, I was going to talk about another approach to quantum knots uh, in terms of lattices. We take a cubicle lattice and uh, uh, essentially uh, a honeycomb of three spaced as a cubicle lattice. Each edge is either in the knot or not, so that's a qubit. If it's in, it's a ket one, and it's out, it's a ket zero. Uh, and you can define uh, quantum knots in terms of lattices, it's an other approach. Um, it has the advantage of bringing some of the differential geometry into the model. I'd like to end with showing you some of the uh, equipment we have at our uh, 
uh, UMBC Quantum Knots Research Lab. Uh, in fact, we're very proud of our state-of-the-art quantum knots research equipment. And uh, we've just uh, we've purchased the latest equipment in this area, and I'd like to show you some of it. Uh, here is an uh, example. We use this for spatial uh, uh, visualization, uh, Tinker Toys and Zoom Tool. And we also have, uh, let's see, what is this? This is Rogers connectors. This is a, a honeycomb of three space different from the cubicle honeycomb. Originally, I was thinking of using this model, but it was simpler to stick to the cubic honeycomb. And that's basically it. And this is certainly weird. And I'll open everything up to questions. Let me see if I can get out of this for a second. And uh, Thanks, Sam. Let's see. Oh, hi, I'm just trying to see if I actually enlarge this now. Oh, stop share. There, I've done it. There go. Okay. Uh, any questions? I hope I didn't go too fast. Um, I wanted to cover with the quantum lattice knots, but there's no, just no time. With the quantum lattice knots, it was fun because I was able to get the, uh, the moves where it can be transformed into variational derivatives, and the differential forms, and stuff like that. Okay, I'm open for questions. Okay, John Williamson. Where are you? Oh, there he is, yes. Hello, hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. No, thanks very much for the talk. I, I, I enjoyed that. Um, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested in uh, knots as particles, of course, as you might expect. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, well, one thing that struck me is, um, interestingly, you showed that three by three matrix of, um, of a couple of quantum states, um, which were defined in the top left and bottom right corner, it's just circles and said that wasn't transformable in that set of rules to the one which was also looped, but just over the full set of nine tiles. Right. I, I'm intrigued about that. Why, that that's very interesting. That's, that's possibly very interesting. But, but why? why? Why is that not the same state? I mean, it looks like the same state, doesn't it? It's both, they're both just circles. Well, I, had a, I have a, a, a way of proving that. I went to the, uh, the larger Hilbert space of all mosaics, and I showed that it was impossible to get from one to the other using just the ambient group. It's a little tedious of proof, but you can try. I tried for many, oh. <laughs> uh, for a long time, trying to transform one to the other and finally realized that uh, it was necessary to prove that it can't be done. I can't go, if you want, we're offline, we can meet and we can discuss the actual proof. It oh. is fascinating. It, 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 it's, it's kind of, it's kind of I, I, I find that, See, there is a difference. One of them, they have curvature. Each point has curvature. So, so the two, the two circles in top left and bottom right, they curve, 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 curve. Right. The other one has to be straight for a little bit. So, do, do you assign an energy to that curvature by any chance, or, uh, or you, you talk about a Hamiltonian here? And uh, well, I didn't talk about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, it's an interesting question. How to assign an energy? One way of doing it is to use curvature as you suggested. An energy, uh, yeah. And you can see that each arc is uh, basically a quarter circle. Yeah. So you take the reciprocal of the radius, you have the curvature. Yeah. And uh, use the, and you can simply define energy in terms of Hooke's law and curvature. Yeah, I was thinking that might be a way to go because then you'd have a, a reason why the two were non equivalent. Right. They were both, yeah. Because, or, or even that the middle one, the, the big one, was non existent. Which would be uh, because it doesn't conserve energy around the loop, so uh, so, so 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 there's a mismatch at the boundaries. Anyway, no, fasc fa that's fascinating. But uh, coming back to energy, well, uh, yep. go ahead. Coming, coming back to energy, you also had uh, your, your tiles aren't really unitary, are they? Because some of them have got nothing on, some have got a single line, and some have got two lines on them. Some have got two curves. So uh, I'm not sure what you're saying, aren't they? They look unitary to me. They're uh, basically the permutation matrices, which have to be unitary. Okay, the permutation, but, but, but some of them have more than one line on them. So, you know, if you have one which is just a square with a single circle on it, that, that would look like one unit of energy to me. But if you've got a square with two circles on it, then that, that's two units of energy, isn't it? Or is your unitariness in terms of the transformation at the, at the boundary points where they click onto one another? 
Well, mathematically, you're transforming both at the same time, one with one energy and one with the other. But if you want to talk about energies, it's better to go to the other model I couldn't talk about, the quantum lattice knots, where you can use the differential geometry of three space uh, to actually play around with it. And uh, but okay. I don't want to about why you say they're not unitary. Well, they're invertible, so by definition, they're unitary. Well, okay. unitary means, okay. Reversible. reversible. They're reversible. So they're... They're, rever they're, they're involutions. That's absolutely right. They're permutations. And permutation matrix lies in the orthogonal group, real orthogonal group, which lies in the unitary group. So they're unitary transformations. Okay, fair enough. So okay. I don't understand what you're asking. That's an interesting question. Well, um, I'm, I'm just... I'm thinking John, about are you asking a question about the diagrams? Yes, I'm asking a question about the diagrams, about the about the tiles on the, a tile on the diagram. But a tile is not a transformation. No, that's what I was. That was what the question was about. So the tile doesn't represent transformation. The transformation is actually the loop, and that's unitary. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the loop. The loop. The, you have a group element which is a motion on a loop. That's, that's right. I mean, for me, a particle is something which is a continuous loop. Which, 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 so, so, so that for you is a set of tiles which have uh, what were they? What were you calling them? Was it a proper or they had a, an, a they had appropriate connections all the way around where everything was connected. That right, was, everything oh, had to be connected. Oh. Other than so, a, when you've got something like that, you've got a knot, and that's going to be unitary. That's going to be a unitary transformation because the no, no, the knot is no. not a unitary transformation. No, okay. No. Transformations um, from one diagram to another. Right, are but then the whole system is unitary because it goes unitary, 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 unitary all the way around, right? Yeah, I've seen, uh, John, yeah. when I've seen your, um, um, we, we discussed uh, some of the things you're doing and when your, your curve, your knotted curve moves, that's a unitary transformation, right? Yes, yeah, so for, for me that is, yes. Yeah. So I was just trying to see that in terms of the diagrams that you're putting down. I can see that the flow is unitary and the transformation from one tile to the next is unitary. Um, yes. So yeah, okay, that's fair enough. And of course, in terms of matrices, well, the matrices are unitary space, and it's unitary. So, John, John yeah. when you draw a knot, it looks like you're moving from one tile to the next, to the next, to the next, and going around until you come back to where you started. Yes. That's the way you're thinking about it. That's the way I'm thinking about it. But but in our model, that's on block a tensor product of oh, tiles. It's so, one thing. It yeah. it isn't. Uh, it isn't yet any kind of transformation. So there's no transformations within tile to tile. The thing is the, a unitary system as a whole. The, the, the knot itself is a vector. Yes. The knot itself is a vector in a Hilbert space. It's a vector in an 11-dimensional Hilbert. 11. Um, I, and no, it's in, a, in an 11 to, the, to some in, power in square, dimensional. 11 to n squared. 11 squared Hilbert. Okay, right. So now... Okay, right. I, I want to get talk about these a bit more technically, I think, at, at some point. I'll let other people have some questions at the moment, but I might come back to this. I'll see how things go. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you some more about this, too. Yeah, yeah right. definitely. Doug yes. is next, and then Peter Master. Thanks. So, I see that you're using Hilbert spaces. So, I could say, yeah, you, you say, because I'm using Hilbert spaces, I'm doing quantum. But qubits and quantum computation thing, has things like Hadamard transform, Toffley transform, the controlled knot. These are the operators for quantum computing. And so the question is, are you just using Hilbert space mathematics and not really doing quantum computing? Or can you map all of your operations into the quantum computing operations or vice versa so that you could potentially, here's an example. If you could show, you could use a quant, if you could show that there's a relationship between quantum computing operations and your operations, then you could use a quantum computer to show two knots are equivalent. At, sure. at speed up, at like speed up, quantum speed up, like they do with Shor's algorithm, or is that not how you would apply this? So that's sort of the context of my question. Now, I mean, you've got 11 tiles, right? So to represent there are 11, no, there are no 11 dimensional qubit systems. Yeah. They're but, even, or you can have a Q trit, or, but you can't have an 11 yeah, dimensional. I understand that. These are 11 trits, or whatever, yeah. are 11 in, in, okay. we don't uh, know how to, 11 yeah. bits, or what do we call them? Quantum bits. But yeah, there's, a, there's a few bits. Let me finish just one second. 
you have 11 tiles, so you can represent 11 tiles in terms of four bits, 16 possibilities. So you could represent the tiles in terms of qubits. You, each tile would correspond to four qubits, and all the operations would easily transform into a quantum algorithm, albeit yeah, so complicated, you, you but there. So have you done right? that in the sense of mapping it to qubits? I mean, it's a simple procedure to convert everything um, it's, it's straightforward to convert, convert everything into qubits. I, I don't see that you, you yeah, learn anything. If you have an advanced math degree. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm asking for the formula to do that. The formula? I mean, how would you take all your not stuff and put it into actual qubits rather than just damn, well, rather than pure Hilbert spaces that have 11 terms in it? Let, let me try to say something that should clarify this. I mean, the, the basic theorem in quantum computing is that C naught plus some local unitary transformations generates all the unitary transformations. Right. Yeah. So if you formulate a system involving a certain well-defined set of unitary transformations, as Sam is doing here, then that can be, in principle, rewritten in terms of C naught and the local unitaries. Okay, so someone needs um, to do that now. Yeah, it can be done. Yeah, it could you be. might want you might want to make it completely explicit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you can make this very. I just I do this with for all sixteen tiles, and uh, maybe I'll just do this. But I mean I start with uh, ket uh, ket zero 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 and then ket zero 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 one, and you can easily transform this into the Hilbert space of a Hilbert space of yeah. two bits. I mean, for example, I how would you do a Toffley gate? In your right. in your representation, you do the top that, gate, I'm asking that as a structure. You do a C naught gate, uh, Hadamard gate, anything you want, phase gate, it's all there. Ah, ah, but but he's asking another question. He's saying, given that we have lots of unitaries that generate the unitaries for the quantum knots, yeah. can we generate the rest of the unitaries? To generate quantum computing from the unit, from the Rademacher, from the ambient group. Yeah. What's the I don't know that we thought about that. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, when we're dealing with Rademacher moves, aren't we? Right. Yeah, we I take the unitaries that are yeah. generated by Rademacher moves and ask mm -hmm. whether they're sufficient to generate. All unitaries. Quantum well, computing. So, there. because of the theorem, they are entangling moves. Uh, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, let's, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a, I'm not ask, I'm asking if you've done it already. Great, share it with me. If you haven't done it, that's okay too. It's just an interesting stretch goal for your team to look well, at. Well, it's an interesting question you're asking, Doug. It's a very interesting one. I, um, there's so many things to to work on here. That's one yeah. of the things I haven't really looked at. It, it looks straightforward, but. Uh, Okay. Good to get into the details there. Okay. When you write the paper, send me a copy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Peter Massa. Uh, well, I want to ask a similar question to Doug. Uh, how does this theory deal with universal computer construction? Because. Uh, uh, I think that's vitally important. That's vitally important. This is this is a, a quantum mechanical process, which would enable a uh, a quant uh, enable a quantum computer to construct uh, a, a quantum computer in the sense of construction to make a to make a, 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 a complete replica of itself. Well, I think you're asking uh, the same question. Um, we we need that for we need that for living systems because we are ourselves able to make uh, 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 make 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 in a certain sense be able to make a, a replica of ourselves. Okay, uh, I think. Oh, go so, ahead. Uh, and and uh, Feynman has shown that in fact. Uh, you need other computational primitives other than the, the ones uh, uh, that Turing used us for digital compu computation. Like you have to have a unit wire and you have to have a, um, uh, uh, an, a, 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 a an operation that uh, changes 
AB into BA. So you have to be able to exchange the signals. Um, and uh, you're able to have, be able to have, to have a fan out where one signal becomes two different signals. And the fan in when the two different signals make a, um, a, a single system. Now, I, I know very little about uh, not, not theory, so I'm, I'm just asking uh, uh, if you know this, if this, whether this, your system uh, deals with that possibility uh, or if uh, that, that again is uh, something else that could be added to the, uh, uh, added, added to the system. I, I think I understand your question. I mean, uh, um, I think it's almost the same question as Doug. Can you get uh, universal quantum computing with the Reitermeister moves and the planar isotopy moves? That's a good question. I think that's probably true, but uh, I'd have to spend some time uh, just verifying that. I was interested in understanding the behavior of knots within quantum mechanics. I wasn't asking that question, but uh, that's a good question to ask. Is that a complete set of operations? In which case you just do computation with knots. My guess is true because you have entangling operations. And if you have one entangling operation and all qubit operations, then you can do anything you want. Theorem of Salovey and Kataev, I think. Yeah. I hope that, does that help, or Peter? Or? Uh, well, no, 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 but it's a, uh, it's a fundamental, it was a fundamental discovery of, uh, of von Neumann's that uh, you could have universal computer construction uh, and um, uh, that, that's, usually, that's usually performed in relation to a, 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 a lattice. You can, uh, you can have a, a program but it runs very very slowly or it did in the, in the days when I first tried it which was uh, way way back um, that, that actually did this. It, uh, now, strangely enough, it puts out a sort of thing like an umbilical cord, uh, and it starts to build up the circuitry of the old of the old universal computer uh, 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 universal computer construction, uh, uh, and then it uh, goes through operations which uh, uh, turn uh, circuits which can uh, send signals in both directions so they can only serve they can only send them in one direction and then it uh, uh, builds up the computer gates uh, and then when it's actually finished it goes back and it cuts the umbilical cord and so mm. you have an independent uh, computer uh, universal computer construction uh, and uh, no, nobody seems to uh, pay much attention to this particular work of, uh, of, of, of von Neumann's. Uh, and I believe it's vitally uh, important if we are to understand how living systems, uh, living, living systems work, uh, because basically, as they say, uh, we ourselves have a mechanism by which we can construct a replica of ourselves in inverted commas. It's, uh, it's a replica that has uh, some, uh, some variations. So uh, I, I'm just posing this as a, as a problem. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, uh, Lou, I, Colin, did you have your hand up or did, was I misreading bodily signals? Lou, you go first. Oh, yeah, uh, I just I just wanted to make a, a further comment about what Peter Marser was saying. It, it isn't the case that this has been exactly neglected, the notion of replication. Um, it's been thought about a great deal, particularly in terms of lambda calculus and other things. I think that Peter is implicitly raising the question of how a self-replicating machines and that area of thought is related to quantum computing and maybe to this formulation of quantum computing in terms of nonce. Um, uh, I do not know what that looks like. Uh, 
replication in relation to quantum computing, but I bet there's some literature about it. Hmm. Could, could be. Well, I, 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 tend to, uh, I tend to present something on it myself, which isn't related very much to, uh, uh, to, Peter's, to Peter's work. I um so I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, can I, I wonder if I can ask a question, Sam? Um, sure. It it seems to me that what you've presented is a kind of iconic w approach to quantum mechanics, and this I find very educationally interesting, and and it seems to have a parallel to Spencer Brown iconic approach to mathematics. Uh, is this a way, do you think, of presenting some of the issues of quantum mechanics to people who might find the, the traditional symbolic representation of quantum mechanics off-putting? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I think about that a little bit. I, I, was, I had a different set of objectives, but I'll take a look at that. Um, I'm... I'm not sure exactly what you mean by iconic representation in this case. What do you, can well, you use, elaborate? You're using pictures. You're using a very powerful visual metaphor uh, oh. in place of what are quite complex um, symbols. Oh, uh, I see. Yes. Uh -huh. I hadn't thought about it that way. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. Okay. Lou? are a lot of diagrammatic approaches to quantum mechanics. Uh, some of them are, in fact, uh, implicit in the way people do quantum computing. They write circuit diagrams. So those diagrams are iconic and very helpful. And then there's a whole group of people in Oxford who use, use diagrammatic category theory to uh, represent quantum computing. And it's, they do a lot of very interesting things, right. um, uh, some of which is implicitly mixed up with not theory in a different way <laughs> okay so that, 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 that's that's very interesting okay richard uh thank you very much for this talk i enjoyed it uh um, well, thank you <clears throat> your uh, various tiles that had curves on them reminded me of the types of curves that are used in uh, penrose's a periodic tiles to figure out which constructions are viable and which are not. Um, and does the quantum computing aspects of this generalize to periodic and what that means? To his aperiodic tiles, is that what you're asking? Yes, because you need to draw similar curves to the aperiodic tiles in order to understand which matches of edges are and which matches of edges are not valid. There was a sign, I think it was in the Scientific American article within the last six months, but it's not instantly accessible right now. Um, let's, my guess is you could use uh, Penrose's uh, um, tiles to actually do something similar. I hadn't I thought about it, I think it's a great idea. You can make that quantum mechanical. I'm not sure where it's going. I, I guess the issue is what questions to ask in that regard. I remember John Conway, he was playing with the Penrose tilings. He had his whole dining room table for months with the tiles all over. And uh, right. they're and fun to play with. Those curves on them. Yes, they are curves. You could do actually the same thing. I, I haven't tried it. I haven't even thought of it. I think it's a great idea. Okay, Doug. Mute, mute. Can't hear you, Doug. Okay. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Oh. The cord was in the way. So if we can do all the logic operations, we should be able to get to the true entangled state, the bell state. Have you have you looked at that yet? Because to me, you look at the bell state and you go. Schrodinger equation is all about energy and sort of like linear transformation, but I don't know how the Schrodinger equation, for example, is created to the Bell state. And so the question is, a Bell state, 
if you look at it from our geometric algebra that we, Mike, Mike and I do, it shows up as this inseparable state. And the question is, how do you get to that in your representation? Well, I, I'm not sure of the question you're asking. You can create entangled states in the, in the Hilbert space of quantum knots. Uh, uh, you can reduce it all that to qubits. Uh, why do you want the Bell state? Uh, I guess well, you, if, yeah, you could create I mean, the Bell state consisting of uh, maybe um, instead of using zero and one, you could try um, a, a trefoil and a figure eight knot and create a, a Bell type state of quantum knots that way. Well, that, that was sort of the question is what does a Bell state look like in a knot theory? I mean, maybe that's another way of asking the question. So. I'm not sure it's a Bell state. Uh, oh. I mean, it, it behaves it, in one sense. It, it's a much larger entangled state, I guess, in terms of the tiles. Uh, yeah. um, Maybe I we'll could draw to... you a picture of a bell-like state, but it would be much more complicated. I'm not. I'm not sure what your question is. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I I spend a lot of time looking at bell entanglement. You know, bell states and and entanglement, um, and I think that's sort of like the, the stepping off point from classical physics because those behaviors look non-local in the 3D space. And so why is that, you know? And it's because it's a four-dimensional state embed, trying to embed it in three-dimensional space. You can't really do it. That's where the non-locality paradox comes from. So I'm just interested in all kinds of thoughts and thinking and looking at that from a topological perspective to see why that entanglement is so different. So when you use the word entangled, you have to look at it from the perspective of how quantum, quantum computing looks at entanglement, not just use the word entangled as a generic phrase, which it's not. It's very specific in quantum computing. So. Right. It's a very specific. You're absolutely right. I wish you, uh, um, I may still have the same talk I gave at AMPA two years ago on quantum entanglement. Huh? and the different aspects of it. Uh, there's a lot to quantum entanglement. Uh, yeah. You could spend your whole lifetime on it. And uh, uh, if you want, I can send you a copy of those slides I, I gave the talk on. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Doug at quantumdoug.com. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Lou has a comment for that too, right? Yeah, another question. Looks like it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th this is a comment actually related to another aspect of of uh, the work that Sam and I did, but Sam wasn't thinking of that when you asked him the question, I suspect. The, the Bell basis transformation, which is, let's talk about, Doug, the Bell basis transformation, all right? Is that all right with you? I, rather than the Bell states, I want to talk about the Bell basis transformation. Well, if you look at the Bell basis stand, standpoint in Hilbert space, it looks like it's reversible. But in yeah, geometric but space, I'm talking about a gate, a gate, yeah, a, yeah, but, a four by four gate, which yeah. takes you from from zero 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 one one zero one one to uh, a collection. Each one goes to I an entangled agree. state. That's the Bell basis transformation. Well known. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. It's topological. And one comment about that is yeah. in Hilbert spaces that looks reversible. Yeah. It's well, it, it's unitary. Yeah. Yeah, it's unitary. It's reversible. It's unitary, and it can be used as a substitute for the C naught gate. Right. It's and and it's in, highly is, entangling. But now I get to my point. Okay. It's topological. Okay. It satisfies what braid theorists and statistical mechanics people call the Yang Baxter equation which means that you can think of it as a braiding transformation, a transformation from a braid written one way to an elementary braid written another way, which I can't draw while I'm talking, but it's a fundamental uh, equation. So that what that means is that you can use the Bell basis transformation to create partial topological quantum computing. Um, it really is related to topology Yes. And the fact that it's related to topological entanglement is related to the fact that it is an entangling transformation, but the relationship is not understood fully. Okay. Um, that is uh, in a somewhat different way of thinking than the quantum knots, but it is very topological. And it mm -hmm. turns out, in fact, to produce some link invariants. 
You can so detect the, the Borromean rings. Yeah, the reason I'm asking the question is because in geometric algebra, we don't treat the entangled state, the, you know, as the Bell basis states as a result of applying the Bell operator. As vectors, we treat them as bivectors. And when you do that, you realize that, that you're erasing information and you have the problem of Landauer's principle where you're erasing state, okay? So because we're treating them as bivectors in geometric algebra rather than vectors, it has a slightly different meaning. It looks similar, but it's different. And I was wondering if your not theory approach would help us unravel well, which one's real. Hmm. Is it really a unitary transform that's reversible? Or the, my interpretation of geometric algebra says it's erasing information and it's not unitary. In fact, I proved it in my dissertation 18 years ago. So it, it, it looks, the math looks similar, but it has a slightly different meaning if you're doing it in geometric algebra versus Hilbert spaces. That's why I'm asking the question. Uh, Thank you. I need That's to look at what you're doing in geometric algebra. I'm not sure from your description what you're saying. Um, if you could see in more detail, maybe you could send me some calculations. Yeah. I could look at it. I could answer it more explicitly. Yeah. My talk covered it maybe too fast. Mm -hmm. But essentially, if you have a state and it looks like some of a bell state and a magic state, and you apply either a magic operator to it or a bell operator to it, two of those are going to be erased because they, the, the multiplicative cancellation in geometric algebra. So as soon as you erase those states, you can't get them back unless you measure it, which is adding the information back as a result of the measurement. Um, and Hilbert space doesn't give that prediction at all. And that's the difference, major difference between Hilbert space representation and geometric algebra is the erasure of information in, due to Bell, the Bell operator. And Doug, do you have that written up in a paper or in your thesis, perhaps, uh, uh, in that same way? It's written up in my paper in the sense that I prove that it's irreversible, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Could you send the paper? Yeah. Send us the paper. Yeah, yeah. Send, me, send me a copy of the paper. Also, um, instead, Wooters uses the magic transformation in a, a different way. Um, yeah. um, so you've... Uh, You've used the term magic that's already been used before, but that's yeah. okay. Magic and Bell are, are the, are the, are the right. complex conjugates of, of each other. That's all. So. But, yeah, send uh, us a copy. I'd like to take yeah. a then we can converse. I, I I'd be able to understand more of what you're saying. A quantum computing in Python. I've also built the geometric algebra version of Python, of quantum computing in Python. And mm -hmm. I can see the differences side by side. And I'm just trying to get some help from people who, who might have a better perspective of why that's different and which one is real. Are you going to demonstrate that later, um, Doug, this week? Yeah, I mean, we can show how that, that is easy to prove in Geometric Algebra tool on my talk next Tuesday. Sorry, that, that would be really good. Yeah, I'd be interested in uh, uh, going to your lecture on that. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Mike Horner has a question. Uh, can I just comment quickly on, on, on that? Th th there are a set of papers, I think. I'm struggling to remember the name. Christian comes to mind, who is looking at the differences between what happened in, 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 uh, in uh, non-commutative algebras, such as the Clifford algebra, compared to vector algebras in terms of the Bell inequalities. So there's a set of papers on that. I guess you've seen them. Just, just a comment for everybody. Is, is, is Christian the right guy? I think it is. I haven't seen those, but if you have a link, that'd be great. Mm. Okay. Hi. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a very general question, probably for Sam and for Lou. Um, <clears throat> you guys, along with Doug, are talking about leading edge stuff. And because Doug's fascinated and determined to build a quantum computer. But I'm interested in whether the origin of not very was perhaps uh, one of the many efforts to help uh, Hilbert sort things out way back. Can you talk about the historical side of things, maybe Lou or Sam? Well, there's a lot. Uh, I have a paper, uh, I guess, uh, I think it's entitled uh, Electromagnetic Knots or something like that, where I talk about some of the origins of, uh, of uh, knot theory. And, uh, um, Gee, for some reason, uh, 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 not that it was developed uh, because I uh, was at uh, uh, Lord Kelvin uh, postulated or 
guessed or conjectured that maybe knots were knotted vortices in in the ether. And uh, what's the name of the the uh, physicist who actually made up knot tables to study uh, this this method? Tate. Tate. Peter Guthrie Tate. Tate. And his famous table of knots, not that they arose from physics, and uh, Lord Kelvin's. Um, theory of atoms is not at vortices. It's most amusing. So you've hit it right on uh, target there. So everything must originate from physics, right? Must be. Well, I was actually asking now, I was asking whether this was yet another effort to avoid the weird symbolism of, uh, of logic and trying to do things which, as Mark said, you know, more iconic. And is it in that sense, uh, somehow related to uh, helping Hilbert make everything formalizable. Oh, well, we actually made not there into a formal system. Interesting. Lou, you have something to say? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that Hilbert uh, did anything in relation to knot theory or, or, but the knot theory is very iconic and it reminds you of other kinds of iconic logic, you know, like Venn diagrams and so on. So there is some relationship at the iconic level, but I don't think Hilbert was ever in the knot theory game or no. his work was related to it in any way. Okay. Um, uh, was there somebody else? I... Well, I'll just, uh, so when did knot theory actually start? Like if we get some dates on it in terms of the history. Let's see, Lord, uh, James Clerk Maxwell wrote an interesting letter um, to, um, I think it was to Tate, or is it to Lord Kelvin? Do you remember, Lou? Um, talking about um, knotted vortices. Well, Maxwell was studying knots, yeah. Yes, he was actually studying knots. Wow. But, that was uh, but, prior, to but prior to Maxwell, you have um, listing. Oh, right. Gauss's that, student. And was listening Euler's him. student? I thought it was Gauss. Gauss's, you know, well, Gauss's yeah. student. Yeah, right. Thinking right. of particles. So it's Gauss. Gauss. Gauss was there. Okay. Lou, let me say something. Thinking of particles as knotted vortices just gave it an impetus, and you've got the tape working on it, the tape conjectures, but knots were known much before that. In what sense? I mean, knots are around as physical objects, or I mean, as I, I, I don't know. There must have been some mathematics on it, though. People must have considered it. I'm not. Ken, Ken okay. Perko points out to us that Maxwell had the Reitermeister moves. <laughs> That's so good. Reitermeister, do they? I had a Maxwell question also about relativity. <laughs> I had a question about Reitermeister move R zero. It just feels so elusive and weird that, uh, I mean, it, it, with respect to changes and, and kind of, it feels like a trivial sort of move, but also there's something about R0 that, uh, I don't know if, 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 if you wanted to talk about. <laughs> well, it's people. a planar isotopy. It's actually yes. a planar isotopy. Of, if you look at the diagram in the plane, it's an isotopy of the plane. That's a planar iso. You're just wiggling things around. Yes, yes. Rather than in three space, it's a planar isotopy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to say it. You you can wiggle lines a little bit. Topologically, they're the same. Just can't uh, make them pass through one another, or to break them apart, or put them together. Uh, and those are just the, the moves you can make in the plane without doing anything else. So the planar isotopy move. Uh, preserves the topological type of the projection. That's what it does. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it was just reminding me of just four color theorem and things like that. I don't know if, if that makes sense to bring into this discussion <laughs> or, or, or formations of in, in Spencer Brown's work and Lou's work. But it's everywhere. Totally, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's a totally different topic bring up <laughs> well not totally yeah. different it's just that you see you're you're backgrounding the jordan curve theorem because you know it's very simple in the combinatorial case yeah 
Uh, you're not worrying about it. But it's there. You can draw very complicated, simple closed curves, and they're all equivalent to circles, and that's in the background at Rademeister move zero. Everything's connected to everything else. <laughs> okay, well, that feels like a step forwards. Um, uh, <laughs> any more questions? Okay, so um, I think I think we're done. I think we're done. Sam, thank you so Sam, much. Sam, thank you so much. I'm going to have Thank to watch you your present, I'm going to have to watch your presentation again, uh, which is what I say to most of the presentations, which I, I don't fully understand the first time round. But oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, no, no, no. I, it's not your fault. It's my fault. And um, <laughs> but this is this is the thing. I mean, we're we're capturing all of this stuff, and I'm I'm actually fascinated. I've got a kind of um, I. I I, I've got a kind of children's game in my head at the moment where, where you know, you can teach kids about quantum mechanics in, by moving tiles around. That'd be great fun. Um, oh, right. Uh, I have a, there's a computer program that John Squire at UMBC wrote, and I'll try to send you the link to that game. It's on the web. Thank you. Thank you. Because uh, this stuff is important. And uh, there's a game called our heads around it. Oh, it does the same thing. I put a link in that in the chat already. Right. Oh, thing. thanks. I didn't get it. Could you email us, uh, email this? Because uh, I can't, for some reason, I can't copy what's in the chat box. Uh, in this box. Well, you should be, are you, are you on the AMPA chat list? Uh, are you getting all the messages that I'm sending around with the videos and the chats? Is I think so. You're not on there. Can I'll get it I, there. Good. Right, if anybody's there. not on there, put your name in the chat now. And it's actually um, Anton. Where's Anton? Is he here? No. Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. It's Anton who's uh, who's administering this. So uh, yeah. Anton is the person to talk to. Yeah, well, also, if you go onto our, our website, uh, ampa.onl, you will see in the menu video presentations. And it's a drop down menu. And you go down and see the uh, this year's conference talks, and uh, you see all the talks there with all the commentary that was in the chats. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. And I've actually, Anton, I've got some earlier um, chat stuff for the earlier talks as well, which I'll send you. Um, or I can put it in myself, actually. Uh, but anyway, but Sam, thank you very much. And um, you know, this is this is really this is really good, interesting stuff. Thank you. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Mm. Colin. Astrology. Uh, yeah, I'll put a bit of that in, yes. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Um, inertial drag. Okay. Oh. Dragging, dragging of inertial frames. It explains the universe, or explains dark matter, and it also gives a model for astrology. Wow. Wow. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see well, this, see. this is, this is great. And um, uh, well, I can't. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, Nicholas talk that. Uh, mentioned yes, that's right. What, what are the stars for tomorrow? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do astrology. <laughs> okay. Just interested. In, it does work sometimes. It's yeah. not predictive. It's a correlation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll send the video around. I'm still um, just just uh, uh, Barbara's video yesterday. She wanted to change a couple of slides, so I'm just having to edit that, and I'll send it around when I get it done. Okay. What, yeah. what about that, Nicola? <laughs> <laughs> they're just. Uh, I went and looked these up. These are these are some of my children's games, but they're not the same tiles. But you can do a lot of interesting things. Yeah. With them. Yeah. No, this is very interesting. <laughs> Lovely. Very interesting. Anton. Yeah. Um, I put my email in about the site. What was that? Was that Sydney? I put my email in about the AMPA site that I couldn't get in. Also. Yeah. Well, but you should be getting in. Just request the password. Okay, I'll try you it know, again. You go and uh, log in, and then you'll see a forgot password. I might have a forgot password on the link. 
but you must uh, request the password because I, you know, and then- No, I, I tried that, but it didn't work, but I'll try it again. Okay, I'll put that password in for you and I'll send it to you. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get into it either. <laughs> Okay. Keith I'm said a... something about the Cybernetic Society this weekend, so look at for that on the chat line. Thanks, Sorry? Keith. Oh, Keith, Keith yeah. Keith said something about the Cybernetic Society this weekend. All right. So look okay. for that on the chat line. All right. Yeah, I can see that. Gosh. Okay. It's, it's interesting how the... Rachel Moore says she also has a problem requesting a password also. Yeah. What is the problem that you're having? Well, I, gener I, re I requested a password, I put in my email, and, and when I, it generates it for me, and then when I go to use it, it still says my login credentials are not right. Um, just uh, replace whatever it generates, uh, replace, don't use a gen auto-generated password, just type in your own password and try it. Okay, okay, because, I'll try again. Um, you know, unfortunately, I can't stop that, but, you know, it does send that out. But, you know, just type in your own password and uh, and see if that works. If it doesn't, okay. give me, uh, just give me an email and I must check up what's happening there. Don't, Thank don't, you. Don't you just love admin? <laughs> it's, there's such a contrast between the administrative conversation and the intellectual conversation. Anyway, <laughs> um, I look forward to more intellectual stimulation tomorrow. tomorrow at five o'clock. Uh, so I'll see you then. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, bye.